right when the we broadcast live. is live. Oh, look who popped in. Right when I hit Easy the live, live button, somebody <laughs> jumps in. Yeah. No, sorry. <laughs> she missed all our intro talk. Oh well. I was trying to set it up. I couldn't get on um uh, I couldn't get in through uh Safari. I had to switch to Chrome. Ah, get the proper setup. Oh, it's good. I hope we're showing up on YouTube. This is the first time that we've come on. We didn't have uh, two or three uh, of the usual band of suspects out there watching. It's showing. Yeah, no, no, that, that's, oh. It's strange. We usually have a couple comments before we come on. I guess yeah. uh, yeah. people are busy tonight. There, oh, we, we, go. Go. there, there we go. It's a lag. It's not us. <laughs> some, and, somebody. Mind the, mind the comics might, might not know we're on at this time because... Uh, you guys already had uh, uh, daylight savings time, daylight savings our change, time. and we only get that uh, a week from now. Yeah, see, that's the thing about having an international audience. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> Europe is falling behind the times. There's nothing we can do about it. We're so <laughs> All right, we got we got people here. All right, we got everybody coming in. We got John C out there. We got the Simply Incredible podcast. Who. Uh, it, it's up to him, but he may be on next week. So yes. ah. <laughs> this third time should be the charm. And uh, okay. Yeah. We got everybody out there. There's just a lag in the numbers. So, Listen, uh, and, since the simply incredible podcast is mostly about other things that are not comics and we might be talking about some, some sort of merchandising. I promise <laughs> that I will show a 112 miniature version of a, of a car that was sponsored by Adolf Hitler. <laughs> if you come, if you come next time, simply incredible podcast. I will show you the car that was paid for by Adolf Hitler. And 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 uh, yeah, and uh, since he's not in America, that's why he can get by with that. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're gonna go around here. Okay, we got Scott. We got the you know we got Jared. We got Paolo. And Jared, would you like to introduce our guest tonight? Daisy Line. She um. Uh, she goes by Daisy and Caroline sometimes, or Daisy Line, as she's sometimes called. But uh, used to work with me in the Marvel bullpen back in the 90s. What years were you there? Uh, I think I started in January of 93 and uh, left somewhere end of 98, early 99, something like that. So she got to live through the glorious bankruptcy years at Marvel. <laughs> Listen, the mirror image thing is totally messing me up. I'm like trying to move right. one way and then I go the other way. Here, yeah, look look at Paolo scaring the future guests. <laughs> <laughs> you should be. <laughs> and then right, so that was a glorious time at Marvel. That was those were the years when um uh when things like Political correctness at work was neither recognized nor understood. Um, <laughs> and uh, where things like, it always amazed me that when tours would come through and uh, you know, with the, all the parents and kids and stuff, they, this, wasn't it that like one mom sort of flipped out that Johnny Green had cowboy suck on his desk <laughs> and yet she somehow, somehow missed uh, the, the photocopied, photographs of like a, a woman being done by a dog from behind and the, like the forensic photo of John Bobbitt's uh, severed anatomy. And well, I think that was a man doing a pig. There was a, no, it was both. It was, was a, woman, a separate one. <laughs> it was a woman with the dog and the man with the pig. Uh, and John Bobbitt. It was just a whole wall of shame. It was just it, 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 all the stuff that we did and had back then was very much, um, you know, that that was not some nothing that we did all day would fly in any of today's workplaces. And where's the pity? Really? And yet it was Cowboy Sucks that got uh, a comment from one of the mothers. Must have been a Redskins fan. Here, here's what's yeah. wild from my point of view here, right? We've kind of in depth on some boring comics where we just lost people. We just dropped people. You come in here talking about cowboy sucks and pig love, and we go up six. <laughs> <laughs> so I, thought I, my, I thought I knew this audience. <laughs> oh yeah, we we got a we got a million of those uh, stories. Yeah. I also one of my other favorites was when um, Stephanie was working as Virginia's assistant, and uh, Stephanie Berrios. And uh, this one group went through and a little kid 
uh, it went walked right up to Stephanie. He couldn't have been more than like eight years old, maybe nine. And he just walks up to her. He kind of leans back and he gives her the look all the way up and all the way down and goes, juicy. <laughs> you have no idea what to do with that. It's probably written on her pants. Um. <laughs> it was not. No, no. Uh -huh. Steph was not a juicy person. She was probably just in jeans. I'm Blanche. I'm calling it. I'm Blanche. So <laughs> every week, I'm Dorothy. The I'm Dorothy. In gives us our nicknames, but I'm Blanche. Yeah. So I have never watched more than a few minutes of the Golden Girls, so I don't know who's who. Then your life is lacking, sir. It's a really good <laughs> show. You get them going. Yeah. Which one it's of you? Is Betty, which one of you is Betty White? <laughs> Because yeah, sure. he's the oldest. I, I think you're Betty White tonight. I don't see any of these guys filling in for her. No, still. Not. Betty White's cool, but her character's dumb, so I can't put, give that one out. You know, no. <laughs> I'll play dumb for a night. I don't care. Whatever. <laughs> guys, so, you know, whatever. You're a special I'm, guest, I'm, so you can be whoever you want. I'm surprised that Mind the Comics remembers the, the Golden Girls because that thing hasn't been on Portuguese television for 20, 30 years. Oh, wow. it's all over the place here, Paula. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're missing uh, nothing, really. Yeah. <laughs> well, is this a new viewer? Fresh News 247 is crossover the savior of comics? Nah. Just a, <laughs> hopefully it's, a, it's not the savior. I think it's, it sounds like it's just fun. Um, it's just another comic. We got a double dose of B, Arthur, because the Golden <laughs> Girls in Maud were on at the same time. Ah. <laughs> Now, Maud's the one I only saw two or three episodes of. I, you know, she was a World War II veteran, by the way. B. Arthur was in World War II. I think she and not and not like she was just sort of like, uh, you know, one of the girls you paid to dance with you before the boys went out. Apparently, she was like in a truck in the middle of it. I yeah. Think oh, yeah, yeah. B. Arthur was pretty mm -hmm. active in the whole World War II thing. <laughs> she kicked ass. Rose. We got a lot of these sleepy readers here. We got a lot, a lot, and a lot of. Uh, not at World War II, but did you know that Dr. Ruth Westheimer was a trained Israeli sniper? I found yep. that out a couple of years ago. I didn't know to believe it because it was on the internet. But apparently it was true. She was so small that she could get into places that other people couldn't. Mm -hmm. I, like, I like to pretend that you know that uh, Christopher Lee and B. Arthur met somewhere in World War II and took somebody out, just in my mind, you know, just to make it cool. You know, That but is a coming crossover story, waiting to happen. Actually. I have, I actually have a Christopher Lee story if you want to hear it. Go, yeah. go. Um, uh, during the summers when I was uh, a teenager and in my twenties, I worked at, uh, I worked at home up in Maine, and uh, I was uh, waitressing at this lobster restaurant in York, Maine. And uh, this dude and his wife came in, and he immediately gave me the creeps when he came in. And I kind of looked at him and I saw it like he, he gave me this big smile and he had like a couple of, you know, metal or gold teeth or something in there. And I recognized him. I couldn't figure it out. I thought he was a teacher who failed me or like <laughs> a janitor who couldn't, who, who hated me or somebody's dad who can say like, I, I just got the feeling that he didn't recognize me. But if he did, I didn't want to be waiting on the table, but I had to. So the whole night I wait on his table and he's the nicest guy on earth, as is his wife. They left me a decent tip, left, and I couldn't figure it out. And it drove me crazy. Three years later, I was <laughs> watching an, an old vampire film and I'm like, oh, fuck, it was Christopher Lee. <laughs> I waited on Christopher Lee all night long and I didn't get to get his photograph or autograph or anything. I was just... I, they just, I guess, twenty-year-old me didn't quite have the wherewithal. Right. Oh but, well, uh, it's just twenty-year-old me would rescue, would rescue, would recognize Christopher Lee. I know. I, I would act like I didn't know who he was, and I would be like, "By any chance, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings, Mister Bompador?" I'm just kind of wondering. <laughs> I mean, and I've sat there trying to have. I would try to have a talk with him about Lord of the Rings because he reads. He, he would read it every year. Every year. Um, every year. Well, but even back in like 1980s. Six eighty-seven. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. Interesting. He started reading them like when they came out. Yeah. He's actually, the only person in the entire cast of the Peter Jackson movies that had met and talked to Tolkien. Mm -hmm. That's when it came time for Saruman to get stabbed, oh, wait a minute, or did uh, Saruman stab Wormtongue? I might be getting it backwards in my head. I don't know if that was the scene or not. I think it was a different scene, but I know which story you're going by. Yeah, go ahead. You know it better. I, I got vaccinated this week. I'm, uh, not, I'm not all there. Congratulations. 
they had a scene awesome. coming up in one of the movies they were filming where somebody got the, their throat slit from behind. Yeah. And they were trying to discuss what, uh, you know, what sound the guy was going to make. And everybody had these ideas, and Christopher Lee stepped up, said that's not the sound that that. Peter Jackson was wanting to scream. He was doing a cold sound, read, wanting to scream. That happens, not what you're expecting. Because he worked mm -hmm. in special ops in World War II. Yeah. yeah. So he knew. Yes, he knew. Yeah. And, and Christopher Lee, the only thing I've heard Christopher Lee ever say is that there's things he's still not allowed to talk about that he saw. So <laughs> he sat there, and Peter Jackson sort of looked at him, and they're like, they were not going to argue with him about what it yeah, sounded like. I think after, after after everybody on the whole crew was like in awe, of like, oh my God. You know? Yeah, they were all sitting yeah. there like, oh, the shit just got real. Yeah. And that, that, that was the look on everybody's face. Yeah. But, they, but Daisy, I was telling them before that uh, I'm a social worker in real life and about 20 of us with some people from a local pharmacy. We uh, vaccinated 400 people in two days of our clients and families. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm getting mine on Sunday. <laughs> Very happy. And to bring it back to comics, I heard yes. uh, from Rick Parker oh, yay. Uh, yesterday. Tell He's everybody who Rick the, Parker um, is. Yeah. He's a longtime letterer at Marvel and also the artist on Beavis and Butthead, the comic, all through the 90s. He drew, did a nice job drawing that. But uh, he want, he's trying to put together a comic. He asked me if I'd do a page. He's trying to uh, put together a comic of people telling um, one-page stories about working at Marvel. Oh. And he said, the only rule is you can't make someone look bad. And I was like, wow, that makes it a lot harder. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, and define, define look bad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, man, so, so, that uh, cuts out a lot. That cuts out like three quarters of the story. So. Yeah, nice. I'll tell you what, I'm not going to like kill the flow and stuff. But we've got many more people here from the last time I introduced <laughs> Daisy and stuff. Let, let everybody know who she is, and then we'll do it a little bit later on in the show. Our special, our special guest tonight is Daisy, who um, worked in the Marvel bullpen with me from '93 to '98. She got to she got to be there for some of the boom years and some of the bankruptcy years and some of the lost years. <laughs> and all, all of the all of the uh, poor decisions years. Yes, uh, all the poor the decisions. We have years. us in the bullpen. Yeah. <laughs> Often involving the Abbey Tavern and Bar X. and There's my bass yeah. sound in the background. Woof. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can have a laundry room. <laughs> He's very obedient. <laughs> All right. So we may or may not have reached that point in the show where we show books and then we get off track and show another book and get off track. Yeah. That, that's why it's chaos in the title. I want to see books. Uh, I'll well, show I'll, some books. Okay. Well, I'll, we I'll got a book little, show. Well, show sort of. This one has a story. I carried this. It took me forever to get the first twelve issues of Ruse from Cross oh, okay. back in the day. This is like Sherlock Holmes, Mark Way, Jackson Geis, Butch Geis, and you know I think the lady in it has some powers or something. But I it took me forever to get all of them, and then I sold it about three months ago. Then I was sitting <laughs> here with insomnia, couldn't sleep. And I went, you know what? I want my ruse back. So I got online yeah. and I got on eBay and found them in order. You know, I was like, I got a problem. So <laughs> I did a video yeah. where I did a two minute and nine, a two minute and nine second uh, haul. So you can look at the covers there. <laughs> so. You know, what you mentioned the lady who had powers. What's weird about that is in the beginning of cross gen, there was four books and they were supposed to be all tied together even though each one was a different genre and took place on a different, in a different world, world. or universe. Yeah. Um, the what tied them together was something, they got superpower, some mysterious force gave them what was called a sigil, yeah. which was what the cross gen used as their logo. And that sigil gave that person superpowers. And then the book was about that person. And then there's the sigil right there. And then as the books went, um, uh, as the as the books went forward in time, uh, some of the some like two years later when they launched new books, they kind of wanted to tie them into that same thing. But a lot of times the creators didn't really want to tie them in. And like with uh, with Ruse, you could Mark Wade didn't want to tie that in. So it's like there's um there's the Sherlock Holmes type character Archer, and then her, her there's his um, sidekick that woman there. 
And they gave her, like in the very beginning, like in the first six issues, they showed she secretly had one of the sigils, like three or four times. And then they just dropped it and never mentioned it again over the rest of the 20 yeah. issues of the series. So yeah. they had a bearded woman too. That blew my mind. Yeah. Anyway. So obviously he was told he had to tie it in, but he really didn't want to. And as soon as he didn't have to anymore, he, he abandoned that whole sigil thing. In, See what I, ruse. what I remember about Christian back in the day for people don't know, but I was reading these interviews and I'm like, do these people not know what they're signing up for? I didn't know. Maybe, maybe it's the context. <laughs> A millionaire decides he wants to start a comic book company. He goes to Florida. I don't know if he built or renovated a great big, huge warehouse. And if you wanted right. to work for CrossGen, you signed an exclusive contract and you moved to Florida. And he would have cots in the back for you to come in, get on the floor, work, and then you can sleep there. And I'm sitting here like, that's a sweatshop. You know no, I mean? no, no, no. I, I, I think you misheard that because from, from what I'm told, you put in an eight-hour day. Mark Wade, Mark Wade did an interview after that where he, that may have been he quit, later, but and that's what he said. But I heard from Sergio Carrillo, who we both know because he worked with us in the bullpen. Mm -hmm. He actually had a pro. He was one of the later guys too working at CrossGen, and he is very fast. He can draw. He draws very fast. So he was having a problem because they were like, "No, one page a day we want done from you," you know, because they wanted people to put the work in and make the stuff up. And he would finish his page up in half a day, and then have to look busy for half a day. <laughs> so I, a lot. I don't know what Mark Wade was doing, but a lot of what I heard was, um, you know, be, be, what made CrossGen different was nobody was freelancers; they were all on staff. Yeah. Yeah. And they all went in there and everybody was expected to get one page, like the, the artist, the inker, the colorist were all expected to get one page a day done. Well, so they, got, they were working nine to five. Yeah. White came out with an interview where like he was acting like he took up for the boys because if the guy went on the floor that owned the place, he'd yell at him and send him home. I, and I, I'd new never pages. heard. I've yeah. heard, heard the complete opposite of that. Because he... He was trying to make it into a good job, they said. I, I, but, but see, it's also in the nature of – the problem, I think, too, was that it's in the nature of comic book writers to subvert whatever the big plan is. That's just the way it goes. That's, that's how comic book right. writers are. So they change it from ruse to elaborate ruse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, when, when someone comes up with a um, – when some editor or boss or something comes up with some big plan that he wants all the writers to follow, the writers are, are like, I don't want to follow that plan. And they follow the plan to a certain extent, and then they subvert it as much as they can. That's the way comic book writers are, because they have nothing invested in the plan. Mm -hmm. Why? They, matter of fact, they, it's the, quite the opposite for especially, especially writers, freelance writers. When you're not an employee – and you're a freelancer, they can hire and fire you at will. And if the fans start to begin to think you suck, they'll stop buying, you You know, you'll stop getting work. And it's, even if it's like, it's not the writer who sucks, it's he's being forced to follow these plans. So that's why it's just completely natural that the writers subvert whatever the plan is. That always happens. Have any of you guys read the story about where Harlan Ellison worked for Disney for one day and he got fired at lunch? <laughs> I can believe that. No, but that's awesome. Yeah, he came in, you know, they gave him an office and everything, and he was eating lunch and he made the mistake of making a joke, talking with some other Disney employees about an erotic movie starring various Disney characters. Oh, yeah. No. By the time he got back to his office, it had been cleaned out and he had his pink slip. That's <laughs> really intense about that kind of stuff. It's a great story. It's a, it's a hilarious story. <laughs> but I bet he could have talked about Pinocchio and got a chuckle. That's all I'm saying. You know? <laughs> but I don't know. That shit's funny. Pinocchio would have been the obvious one. I don't think Pinocchio was one of the ones he talked about. Yeah, he probably talked about Snow White or something. They're like, yeah. oh, no. Oh, I'm no, sir. So Say what you will cool. about Pinocchio and Jiminy Cricket, but no, we will not have any of that. I can see it. And, and Sleepy Reader, I am definitely doing a page for a Rick for the Rick Parker comic. I, I told him I would. So, <laughs> that, yeah, I was about to go up on the comments here. So. Yeah. yeah, which is also why 
reboots never hold. Never, ever, ever has a reboot held at Marvel or DC. Because what always happens is the person who has the power to decide we're going to reboot does not want to be a continuity cop. Yeah. <laughs> We've because had if this you're all, the, if, yeah. Right. If you're, if you're the guy who has enough power to say Marvel or DC Comics, we're going to have a reboot, that guy is not going to be a continuity cop. And so eventually the writers will subvert the reboot. That's just what they do because they didn't agree to it in the front. They're not, you know, it wasn't their idea. They're trying to put their best foot forward. And see, if, if you hamper them with a bad idea, they're going to subvert that bad idea. See, I miss the guys that would like, know they're about to get fired or be mad. And they would like, uh, hide things on the covers in ink and, uh, <laughs> Or have a bookshelf that says Bob Harris sucks and stuff like that in the background and get the book recalled and all that stuff. The legends and lore there. He got yeah, The artists used to hide stuff in the pages all the time, though. I mean, regardless of whether they were pissed off or not. And yeah. At least from what I saw, there was a lot of innuendo and oh, yeah. and then outright, you know, hidden yeah. objects. Yeah, in the animation industry, that's pretty rampant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, oh, definitely. And I have a... Of the the repression it or suppression or repression my, my English is off but uh, at Disney it's because uh, a lot of those animators I mean I know some of them and they don't like being you know reined in quite that strongly. It's been a long time, but the last comic I can think that had something like that was an Ethan Van Skyver drawn new X Men that Grant Morrison wrote, and he wrote he hid sex in every panel, well, and supposedly the colorist was in on it, even though they had plausible deniability. So he would help make sure that it didn't get lost in a background. So you can go through every page and find the word sex hidden everywhere. I, um, I think it's funny that that's something that's not really. It, you know, it's it, it, it's not really technically allowed, but but women with, you know, I mean, every chick has these gigantic boobs. I mean, they're basically, if you didn't, if you colored them flesh colored instead of, right? Well, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking of. There, it, if you if you color them flesh colored instead of, you know, when they're colored, <laughs> don't well, get that, me wrong. That's... I have no problem with that. I just don't know why yeah. that's okay. And uh, you know, in fact, I encourage. Well, but I well, it's not it's not okay anymore. They don't do it. But most all the guys are still naked. <laughs> I mean, let's fit. Most superhero costumes are just paint on a nude male figure, except the crotch, of course. And I'm perfectly fine. With of, that. Speaking That's of true. hiding thing, my, one of my favorite John Romita stories. Captain Adam yeah. is naked. They just painted a symbol on him. Yeah, that. I mean, that's superheroes. Yeah. But one of my favorite John Romita stories talking about hiding things is one day he was telling us that um, he was talking to, I forget who the artist was, a golden age artist that John said he was talking to. And you know, the, um, the uh, seduction of the innocent, the Frederick Wortham book and the pictures for children who know how to look section, which is about the artist hiding penises and drawings and stuff. And John Romita was saying to this golden age artist, he's like, I couldn't believe that. That was crazy. I mean, he's like, we never did that. And the Golden Age artist was like, sure we did. We, we did it all the time. <laughs> John Romita was like, I was defending these guys for years saying they never did that. <laughs> See, when I hear stuff like that, super bad, super bad. Uh, it's one of those guilty pleasures of me laughing at that part. If you watch super bad, he had a problem. And But what got me is how we referred to him. He was like, 6% uh, of kids do it. It's not a big deal. But me, I was drawing penises all the time. And they were big, fat, <laughs> juicy ones. And hearing that... Yeah. Every time I hear it, I hear I hear him saying that in my head. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> big fat veiny juicy ones. And I'm like, get out of my head. Just stop. <laughs> you can't unhear that. Well, the first comic I got this week is two comics. I picked up the deep beyond. It's funny. I picked I was there was only one comic on my pull list this week. So I was looking for stuff to buy. And I found this one deep beyond number one. And it's funny. It's this this cover with the woman with boils all over her. And I was like, and this was the nice cover. And it was like the other cover I thought was ugly. It was a giant monster. And I liked the artwork in it. It was pretty cool looking. And then as I was checking out, I noticed issue two was out this week. 
Uh, so I ended up with issue one and two. And I think this is the one that I was watching one of Sleepy Reader's um, hauls. And he must have got issue one because I started reading it. And I remember Sleepy Reader saying about one of his comics, oh, I think this one was a European graphic album because the lettering is small. And I was looking at it going, this must be it, because the lettering looks small on it. it but it doesn't have the European graphic album uh, proportions. Paolo, but I'm not it, putting pressure on you, but this is usually the time I expect you to pop in. I don't know why. It's, <laughs> it's from Italy. <laughs> well, it kind of looks like Pat Lee art from here. It's, um, let's see, who is it? Uh, Mirka and Dolfo, David Goy, he must have translated, Andrea Brocardo. And Barbara Nocenzo, and it's from um, Deep Beyond is proudly produced at Ar Arancia Studios, Torino, Italy. <laughs> so um, I don't know if they made this for the American market or they made it for the Italian market too, and they're using the same proportions. No, those uh, must have been made directly for the American market for because... Okay. Uh, if they were being published in Italy, they would have to be smaller and black and white. Uh, and okay. if they were working for a French publisher, they would have album proportions. Okay, because the, the lettering is a little small on it. it uh, like a Sleepy Reader said, I, well, I, th I think this is the same book he got. So, But it, pretty good stuff. It's going to be 12 issues, it says, which also made me led me to believe that it might be made for the American market because I don't... I don't think that uh, European books would last 12 issues. Of, no, and, uh, and you wouldn't have a 12-issue storyline. Right, right. But pretty, it's a, another, I guess, post-apocalyptic story that takes place in this. There was some big accident in the year 2000 that degraded the Earth's atmosphere and made monsters and this and that. And, you know, people are living in cities and they got it. There's so many plot lines so much i mean i mean um what is that what uh, oh my god how many post-apocalypse there's the 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 one i just read terra what was the one by tony daniels that just came out last week talking, or the week are you trying to Not refer to all Terra? that's it okay I, how many post-apocalyptic comics there are now that's what I was there's just so like. many knock terra just came out that was one of them um, post Americana that I've been buying, that, that's another one. It, it is amazing how many post apocalyptic comics there are now. But uh, I'll just stick, I'll stick with Commandy. Now, <laughs> I, want to, I want to point out Gore Vidal gets on here earlier tonight. Y'all were talking about offended mothers with children, pig mm -hmm. love, and cowboys suck, and I'm the one who gets in trouble. And dog love, <laughs> <one. laughs> the Australian Shepherd. <laughs> you're the one that brought up the graphic mail. Oh, he was talking about Carmen. Okay, members. So no, 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 no. I didn't, I didn't bring it up. I just had a comment. You know, <laughs> I I did not notice the lettering was small in Carmen, but I think the lettering is even smaller in this one. And they use mixed case lettering, which I I'm fine with. But I know there's a lot of comic fans who hate, or I should say, they're they're all pros who hate mixed case lettering. I'm just like, okay, I, uh, I know Eric Larson, he always uh, mentions that on Twitter, and uh, there's a few people on my uh, Facebook, I can't remember who it was, who were also saying, oh, when they see a comic with mixed case lettering, which means capitals and lowercase, instead of all caps, as comics traditionally are, they just can't read them, and I'm like, why? <laughs> yeah, I think for me, it would just depend on what the lettering style was like. Yeah, I mean, I, I have no problem with mixed case lettering. I I, I like it just fine. It doesn't. Uh, I, but there there are people who the, really the get first time I by. saw it. The first time I saw it on Ultimate Spider Man, I found it odd for an American comic right. because I, I, we have European comics with mixed case lettering. Uh, Tintin is usually done that way. Well, Asterix is uh, is in all caps. Right. Uh, though. Uh, who was it? Fabian Nasiza actually, he, he said something about, he, he's, he, he is a little, he doesn't like mixed case lettering, but it's all tied up with how it happened at Marvel. And it was Bill Jemis declared that all Marvel's books will now have mixed case lettering because he <laughs> thought it made them look more serious. 
This is in the early 2000s. So, so th- I, I can understand that. Like, that Once again, that's how writers have to subvert the, they even have to subvert the mixed case lettering. Thing, I hear so. things like that and they act like it's, uh, I don't know, maybe, um, but it sounds, I mean, it's like somebody's just got drunk on power. Here's how the lettering was. Yeah. You're not talking about like, like small caps and, in other words, you're saying yeah, it's about, lowercase letters, as in like A's, yeah. they're like little. Yeah, letters. that's what I'm talking about. Mixed kids, like normal books have. Right, right. Like you're taught to write right. in second grade. Yeah, they were taught right, as opposed to comics, which are generally done in all caps. Because right. it's a block that, that's mainly for, it's actually harder to read all caps lettering. Mm. Um, it depends. Mm. I think that depends. Not necessarily in common. I'm, I'm talking in general. If you were to typeset hey, all caps lettering, people would not read it. It's generally mm. considered yeah. b- because, but comic book lettering is different because that's hand lettering that's designed to be easily. Um, you get a choice: mixed case lettering or all caps with nothing but exclamation <laughs> mark. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to have um, been in that meeting and to hear Gemma say, "So it look, so it looks serious," and I'd go, yeah. "Oh, you mean serious like Tintin?" <laughs> it's right, style. You know, there's I just think it's it's weird because I find comics more easier to read when it's all caps but if I was and for anybody who doesn't know I'm I actually work in publishing I work for Harper Collins in the children's book section yada yada and but when I read all caps in one of the manuscripts that I get it comes across as shouting because well, it's, that's what it is now. it's not comic book. The, the internet has turned it into that. Exactly. Which is it's why, weird how in comic books I don't see it as shouting. I just see it as... Well, well, that's also because comic books, the art of lettering developed over decades. Mm-hmm. And it had to be all caps because it would take too much time to do upper and lower case. Right. But yeah. since it was all done by hand, comic book artists... Um, Comic book artists learned how to make the most readable all caps lettering there ever has been. Yeah, yep. they, they've actually adapted it from drafting and engineering. Yeah. Font. Well, then, then they had to do specifically designed to be easy to read. Right, mm-hmm. right. Yeah, yeah that's which is why um, when I even now when I look at some of that EC comics lettering that was machine that's done, hard. that's hard to read compared to the hand lettering. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, that's true. Yeah, so, if those were the yeah. comics that we had that you knew that the that they were the poor the, the the most poorly done because it was uh, the it, it was a publisher that usually got a, a rights package and they would do double translation they would get a American news, newspaper strips mm-hmm. which were already translated to Spanish and then they would translate it from the Spanish to Portuguese so it looks uh. very very clunky and because they didn't want to pay a letterer, they would just type it. So you have to... every character the same uh, the same size inside a spe- inside a, a speech balloon, mm. and that that looks terrible. That that just reminded me too. Um, <laughs> what's his name? Wednesday cereal. Um, I think that's who it was. Started a kerfuffle on Twitter. By dissing letterers oh. <laughs> this week, yeah. hey, he was saying something about he, how he sees no difference in lettering in all the comics, and he doesn't understand the difference in styles between letterers and how they have so little, so little room for expression that they don't affect the comic. That did not sit well with some of the letterers out there. Uh, this wasn't is, specifically this, answer. this is why I'm glad I left Twitter more or less because nah. like, it, it's not so much that he has a problem with it. I need the story on how you get to that point to mm-hmm. you have to be like, you know what I mean? Well, like, I just got a middle of Todd Klein going looking around to find a bat to hit somebody with. Yeah. <laughs> Did strip panel naked get involved? I could tell the difference between Ben oh, Oda and John Workman in a heartbeat. Oh, yeah. you know what I mean? was, uh, what's his name? Uh, Pat Brousseau, right? Mm-hmm. Who I never there? met. Yeah. Well, Don't I never met, but he was a bullpenner and Marvel bullpenner in the eighties. I can usually recognize Costanza, and I'm trying to think who it was, who the poor letterer was when uh, you know uh, Claremont was on X Men, 
Because I was Most like, this guy, must, this guy must have one job, and that's to get through a Claremont script. And, Roy Thomas was famous among the letterers because yeah. he wrote. So if you had a letter of Roy Thomas page, you were earning your money. Yeah, I'm a Thomas fan, but I'm telling you, when I go through some of his older stuff, I'm, I'm skimming. That's all I'm saying. Okay. You know, I'm like, <laughs> Now in the seventies, uh, Marvel used to have a uh, Gaspar Saladino doing the the lettering for the for the splash page, and then uh, another letterer would would do the rest of the book. Look at this! Sleepy is trying to get the heat off of Wednesday cereal. <laughs> That's what I, was, he, I, I don't know where he came up with these comments. That's what he was saying. Letterers are pulling the wool over people's eyes. That, that was his basic take. It was so Look, weird. I was, I was like, not there. I was not there. I don't play on Twitter anymore. <laughs> But what has been said cannot be unsaid. The bell has been <laughs> rung. It will not be unrung. <laughs> this man, this man, what do you call it when it's after the fact? You know what I mean? Like whoever this guy is, he just came in after the fact, you know, <laughs> accessory after the fact. Yeah. Post hoc. I, I was actually a letterer for a brief time in the bullpen. And I can say we, we absolutely had a secret agenda. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to, to pull the wool over everyone's eyes. We did. That's I can. It's been twenty five years. We can admit it now. I actually, you know, I, I I actually used to know something like seven words you weren't allowed. A letter was supposedly not allowed to write in a comic because when it it you know it got on the newsprint, it would Clint, come out with one and flicker. Clint. Yeah, those are the two. Clint and uh, Flick. I remember. Yeah. I don't remember the other yep. ones. Clint. Well, one of my favorite <laughs> lettering jobs from the seventies was on the original death lock. I'm not going to get up. I'm about ready to jump. Up. Oh, it's right behind me. Go ahead. I forget who the letterer is, but they hand lettered a computer font. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. I got it right here. I'll, I'll just, it's just like, Whoa. Here we go again. There we go. Oh, my wife walks by and looks at me and I'm like, it's, it, it's, it's, it's not it's not porn. <laughs> Look up who the letterer is. Yeah. It's not there okay. we go. Is it there we go? Look at that. They had a hand letter, a computer font. Okay. And a sort of L C D like, but it's nicer than L C D. And I find it fun. I used to make fun of Dave Sharp for this in the early two thousands. <laughs> because um it's it's now the early two thousands oh. at Marvel. And lettering is all digital, of course, has been for quite a while. And whenever they need a heads-up display or they need a futuristic computer font, they use the LCD font. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, yeah. it just struck me one day. I'm like, Dave, why does digital watch from the 1970s still say future? <laughs> because an Iron Man's heads-up display in his, you know, armor... He can put whatever font he wants there. Mm -hmm. Even Comic he Sans. He, yeah, he can put he can put Garmin Bold, Helvetica, anything he wants he can put there. But they use LCD font to say computer. And you still see it in comics today. And I think that's part of the letterers pulling the wool over our eyes. You know, you're making, think think of this meme. you're making me think of this meme that was going around for a little bit on Instagram or something. And uh, it was like somebody put a uh, co they used comic font, whatever it is, off the computer to print out a page and put it on a copier. Said if you're, you know, refill the paper, somebody came by with a more, um, you know, a more fancy font on their their message back to him. And it said, mm -hmm. we are a Fortune 500 company. Do not use comic font around here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the font. Yeah. yeah. There's a really cool book that's called Typesetting the Future that goes into a deep analysis of different fonts that have been used for different things in science fiction yeah. movies over the years. Well, and the, the comic book that's most used is called Microgamma. Ah, uh, Okay. All right. So, yeah, the other, comic? so the other night, yeah. So the other night, I used to make fun of people about this and in, in lighthearted fun. You know what I mean? Just ha ha, right? The people who would like watch QVC in the middle of the night and be like, I need that and everything, right? So insomnia hit several times this week. I bought several things, but uh, on Instagram, apparently people have auctions, and I went for it, and I ended up getting a first print. Uh, one of 15,000 from 1991 of From Hell for like 10 bucks or something. I don't know. I can't remember oh, what I paid. Cool. Yeah. That well, is what? Cool. Mm -hmm. I said, that's cool. 
Oh yeah, yeah. So this like, came in and I got and I got it in two days. That's what amazed me. Uh, that's faster than eBay and stuff. But when I saw the fifteen thousand, this is an indie book in nineteen ninety one, and apparently that was a big deal because that's one of yeah. the things that says in here is like this is just fifteen thousand printed and everything. That's more than a regular comic nowadays. <laughs> you know I mean? and, and that's 15000 of a book that cost twice as much as yeah. other comics. Yeah. And that's that's kind of important. Yeah. Like, I mean, I've been piecing this together off and on. I mean, of course, when it comes to From Hell, I've got one of the, you know, I got the big collected edition and everything. Um, it, it's one of my favorite works by Alan Moore because it has absolutely nothing to do with superheroes at all. And he, it, it's where I found out he was very versatile as a writer. You know what I mean? Right. So, you know, but uh, Eddie, Campbell, Eddie Campbell's been popping up left and right for some reason, all of a sudden last couple months when I find stuff, you know, I, I just saw someone describing the liking the color on the new uh, from hell, but I have still haven't seen it yet. Well, I found um, there's two or three videos where people are reviewing it and they actually open it up, but just turn off your sound because, I don't get what it is. These people have bought a very expensive book and they have, maybe they're nervous with the camera. I'm trying to be nice, yeah. but the commentary uh -huh. just kills it. You know what I mean? Like you're showing a work yeah. of art here and you're talking like, dude, you know, I'm like, you know <laughs> this is so cool, man. It's, it's green. Look, you know, I'm like, here's turns the page. It's yellow and red. You know, I'm just sort of like, <laughs> <you know. laughs> Uh, Sleepy Reader here says it's digital letters that Matt Agent 42Q Wednesday serial. Well, that's pretty much all letters these days. So, <laughs> yeah, and even some of the things that are quote unquote hand lettered, like um, Bone and Jess Smith and some of Charles Vess's comics, they've created their own hand fonts, but they're scanned yeah. in and they're done in computer. Right, right. Todd Klein. Matter of fact, I, Todd Klein, man. I, he's the man. Yeah. yeah. That's like when uh, I remember back in the 90s when a certain uh, letterer who I don't know if I'm allowed to name, but he first started doing all the, uh, the lettering and the, um, uh, he turned his handwriting into a font and started doing all the lettering. And all of a sudden, all of us who were letterers in the bullpen who picked up freelance lettering on occasion, suddenly poof, well, all went away because this other guy could do all of that lettering work in a tenth of the time that we could do it. And we were just a little bit slow in developing our our own the, font. They were, a, they were a little annoyed when he scanned in other people's lettering, too. Richard Starkings, by the way. I'll name him. I don't care. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Half of oh my, my Marvel God. career was cleaning up Richard Starkings' messes. So I have oh no God. love for him. Even though yeah. I've never met him and everybody says he's a really nice guy. Uh, as the production guy, the, the, the worst part of one, of the, one of the worst parts of the production job is you have no power. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're the one who has to do things the right way or the comics don't print well, which. Right. I'll tell you another story where I had to fix something this week to get a comic to go to press, but not at Marvel. But it was the beginning of it was the beginning of digital lettering. And there were certain things you could and couldn't do. And if you did them, it would mess things up on the printing end. Mm -hmm. Technical stuff. But if you took the five minutes to set it up right, everything would run smooth. Richard wouldn't set it up right. We'd be like, could you have, and we had no, we had, we couldn't talk to him. We'd, say, we'd tell the editor, could you just ask him to do this? Uh, save us all this time. And for whatever reason, he wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And I, I had to fix his stuff too. And yeah. Everybody did. We did. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, half your time in the bullpen in those early days of digital lettering was sent, was spent fixing Richard Starking's stuff. So and it, was, then, it was so insulting to us, those of us who did the hand stuff. There was this weird little thing that always went on. At, at Marvel, we worked directly with the editors and assistant editors but mostly the assistant editors mm -hmm. um, and the assistant uh, and the assistant editors were kind of the worst paid people there in uh, they had, the, they could eventually get promoted to editor and make some more money. But and like a starting assistant editor salary was like $15,000 in Manhattan in oh. 1993. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so they're making no money. Um, so they generally related to us in the bullpen more than they related to their editors. Mm -hmm. Just because they were starting out, they were young, they were poor, they were not treated great because they made no when you make no money and everybody make, knows you make no money like at any job you get treated the worst yep that's just the way work works so um and then and, and we in the bullpen especially before the digital tra transition happened we in the bullpen uh were always on the bottom rung of the corporate hierarchy you know that just like any job there's always you know the people who get treated the worst because they get the worst job mm -hmm. that's just the way life works but like like i said the assistant editors always felt simpatico with us because they got treated the worst in editorial so Sometimes what would always happen was either either the either Richard Starkings would say bad things about us for whatever reason to the editors or the assistant editor, or the editors would say bad things about us or whatever would say, oh, I don't care what they think. See, Richard Starkings might have a whole different story just because I never heard from him. He he might have never heard any of our, the stuff we wanted him to do. I just don't even know. But the assistant editors used to come back and tell us the bad things Richard Starkings would say about us. Now, either they were all lying or it really happened. So that's another reason why. And it's funny, I've never met them. Everybody I know who knows him likes him. And the editors especially liked him because he bit, by being able to letter so quickly, he bailed them out mm -hmm. a lot of times. But part of his lettering so quickly was an extra half a day's work for us. You know, that was part of the process. Oh, so and, and so. Then, then <laughs> he's on a roll, later. man. No, forget it. He's rolling. <laughs> Two, now, now let's fast forward to like 2006. <laughs> when the Germans okay. bombed Pearl Harbor. Right? That, there you go. I'm, we're, really? I'm doing some freelance work for Marie Javens at Teshkiel Comics. She's hiring Richard Starkings to do the lettering. I open up the Richard Starkings, and there are the same mistakes <laughs> from 10 years ago in there. And I just went, Marie, what the hell is this? <laughs> I feel like I and lost some innocence tonight. Like, I'm going to be popping open comics, and I'll be like, Richard Starkings, I wonder who really lettered this. You know, I'm like, you know, <laughs> No, we didn't have to do any lettering work. We just had to do technical stuff on the lettering. Oh, no, no, no. We did have to, to do. You might not have had to, but no, I, I didn't. I wasn't lettering. I'm talking sure. production work. She said it earlier. She said she, I heard her. Yeah, that, it, it, what, it, that, that's all we did. Like in the lettering department, we weren't like lettering full books. We were fixing the mistakes and right. the edits from other things. So all the time we had to like, not only did we have to re-letter something, but we had to copy everybody's. That's what was so insulting yeah. about it was that we had to copy other people's handwriting uh, so that it looked that, like uh, it, it was consistent with that letterer. And Starkings would, you know, I mean, we spent hours with our little calligraphy nibs getting them to the to the right angle and the right file them down and stuff. But Starkings just used a, a plain old line in his font, so it was really, really hard to get to to get it to look like digital lettering. Welcome to Cavern of Chaos, where we are the current affair of comic books. <laughs> <laughs> Cut to another few years later. Nib it in the bud. Uh, I don't even know when it was, 2010 or so. Um, uh, I heard something where Richard Starkings was saying he doesn't know what happened. He lost all his lettering from Marvel and DC. And I was like, I know what happened. They finally got other people who could do the job much more efficiently mm -hmm. i don't know jared i'm picturing you going it was me you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, the production people have no power. it might have been we you know, can't discount production it. people have no power if, if an editor wanted to hire him because he made their job easier they would have yeah, we were definitely the Oompa Loompas of the organization. We were just... Yeah. If, if an editor had a choice between making the editor's job easier and making my job harder, the choice was always making my job harder. That's the way Aww. it is. You know, I, but well, that's just the way, that's the way work works. <laughs> when you're the one on the bottom rung, 
You don't get to tell anybody what to do. You don't get to say, hey, if you do this, it would make my job easier. The person above you is good, they will. But meanwhile, did, did you know that, uh, do you remember the name Albert from Comic Craft? I do not. He was one of the god for years he worked for Mitch Richard Starkings. I only knew him by his name, Albert from Comic, because the editors were always say, oh, Albert from Comic Craft is right. But he died like th a few years ago. I was so sad yeah. to hear, because he was always nice. Whenever you were working with Albert from Comic Craft, yeah. everything was fine. You could say, Albert, could you do it this way? Albert would do it that way. When did he come out? That might have been, been after I left. Uh, yeah, I, 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 my, I think he, you just probably didn't remember, you know, why would you remember Albert for Comic Craft? You know, I, I just know him because he was working for Marvel for a decade or and yeah. and he was the easy one to, you know, if, if, right. if, if some editor came and said, oh, Albert from Comic Craft is lettering this one. And I said, oh, could you tell him to do it this way? He'd do it that way. Yeah, see, I love that. Easy. I love it. the designers where I am. There are some that'll do it like that, too. And it's like yeah. it's a leaf. It's uh, hold on, I gotta turn on some lights. Oh. Turn on some lights. Oh. Well, there's some behind the scenes vitriol for Richard Starkings for no, like I said, everyone I just, says he's a nice guy. I, I got just, this mental just, image of you getting this work from Marie, and he's like, Not again. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It was 10 years. I was like, I cannot be working on Richard Starkings mess ups anymore. <laughs> it's just, I always say something like this always happens where I'm like, this is why I like doing this stuff. This is why I like yeah. comics. Who knew we would get like <laughs> 10, 15 minutes of just letter rage over her stock. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, and, and that's not a slam. I'm like, this you is have, fascinating. You, you know? have no idea how much extra work he caused for me over 10 years. Uh, you know, that it's crazy. Not what Jared, it's not what you're saying. It's how y'all are yeah. saying it. It's real. Mm -hmm. I can feel it. You know what I mean? So. Letter of rage is a real thing. That is awesome. <laughs> what really will, your camera, will your camera go up just a hair? Because we're like getting cut off right in the middle of your forehead a little bit. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's no, it's okay. We're missing it. There we go. Now we'll see the full expressions. So, yeah. <laughs> I have kind of a five head, so I, I, I'm not always keen to, to display. <laughs> Hold on. Let me, let me put all her hair in between. Yeah. I think it's John Workman. I mean, to, to say something positive, I think it's John Workman that walks works with Walt Simonson or did Simonson. Oh, yeah. yeah he's still doing hand lettering. That's yeah. what I say. He's got a very thin line where it almost looks like runes, if that makes sense. It, in right. my mind. I mean, it's very, yeah, he's got a very distinctive style. I can see his stuff from a mile away and know who it is. Yeah, he, he's doing I'm, hand lettering over Walt's stuff. Yeah. I'm that way with uh, Willie Schubert's lettering, too. I can pick him out of the crowd real easy. Nice. Well, not switching gears here, jumping ahead too much, but uh, I was looking at my stack here. I finally, if these will show up, I finally bought some Mr. Monster yeah. Tundra oh. from the 80s. Anybody ever read this? It keeps getting recommended to me. Yeah, Mr. Monster's good stuff. Okay. Well, I finally got some. They're a little bit beat up, but I need, you know, I've heard enough over the years to, I missed out on Mr. X, so I figured I'd try Mr. Monster. <laughs> Did Mr. Monster debut? Mr. Debut. Yeah. Did Mr. Monster debut on, on Alter Ego style fanzines? No idea. None. But uh, I'm going to show this beautiful cover while y'all are talking there real quick. But uh, this is the kind of stuff I love, man. This pulpy, like 70s Charlton looking painted covers. You know what I mean? This looks like. Uh, Gilbert? Yeah. Michael this looks T. Like, Gilbert. Yeah, this looks yeah, like. Michael the, T. Gilbert. Yeah, this if you reminds, like grade monster movies, you're going to love Mr. Monster. All right, cool. But, I mean, this looks like something out of Charlton Comics off of Baron Werewolf, you know, if you go way back. I love it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's got that weird green where I feel like I need to go, like, I got, like, a little tickle on my throat and I need to take a shower. It's cool stuff. <laughs> yeah. I picked up the, the new Grant Morrison written book, Proctor Valley Road, which has got this sort of... Uh, Cartoony Eric Powellish drawing in it. I like well, the I don't artwork. Know, that, that top panel on that one page looked like the Scooby Gang. That looks like Shaggy. Yeah, they're, they're kind yeah. of. Uh, the, it was okay. I'm not buying another issue. Yeah. Uh, the main the main problem I had with it was um, there's sort of this kid gang, this sort of multi ethnic kid gang, and he spent the first half of the book just making them multi ethnic. 
And it was like, you know what? You could have jumped into the story and given us that stuff as you went along, you know? Uh, but but he was like, but it was like that. That so much of the time was kind of spent establishing their the, all their multi ethnic differences and stuff. It was just kind of like, can you? Uh, I got bored halfway through. I'm like, can we get a story here? <laughs> and finally, when the story started, I really didn't care that much. What? It was okay. <laughs> it wasn't terrible. It was just. Not for me. If Grant Morrison is going to use a, an artist like that, that better be a very subversive comic. And well, no. it doesn't look like it. It's, it's Alan Moore worked on Mr. Monster. Sorry, guys. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. It's Boom Studios. It might even be oh, it's, it's suggested for mature readers, but. Uh... You know, I've read some old comics, you know from the stacks over the years and stuff. And you had books like swinging from scooter that would gradually turn into Archie. And then maybe these other books would go from trying to be an Archie ripoff to a Scooby-Doo ripoff. I miss the days where that was the biggest problem it was like, it's a bunch of kids with bell bottoms at a haunted house with flashlights again. Now I miss that <laughs> stuff. You know, now we get stuff like this, you know, <laughs> they've, they've even got the Scooby van. Hold on. Hold on. Let me find you. We got extra people here. There we go, man. Yeah. We've got the Scooby what van up top there. Aww. Okay. Like it, it, it seemed very much like a kid's book, only it says suggested for mature readers, and there was some violence at the beginning that wasn't so I don't I don't know what it's supposed to be. Well also like I said, they sent spent so much time establishing nothing basically that, that I don't know what the story is about. So as these kids on a ghost story thing. I like but the ghosts are real, there's real See, monsters. I'm I see. I think that one of the best takes on the Scooby Gang was on the Venture Brothers, where you tied in Son of Sam and Pills, and does Velma does the yeah does Daphne want to go back in the box if she doesn't listen to the Ascot wearing man? You know the Venture Ed Brothers, Mundy, if you will, on a whole lot of things. Yeah, that was a Ben Edlin written episode. The guy who did the Tick. So I'm just saying, uh, one of the funniest things I ever saw was the issue. It was the episode of the Venture Brothers where they was it. Hank and Dean, I think they went out on a date with uh, Dr. Cult Stanton's daughter. <laughs> he's still sucking on his crotch. He's trying to dry it off in a hand dryer in the in the bathroom. At the club. Oh, oh my God. I laughed till I hurt myself. I yeah, saw. he crawls. He grabs the hand dryer. Yes. Puts his feet on the wall. And then he's like going, maybe if I give it more oh. motion. So it looks like he's humping it. And all these people are just walking in the bathroom while he's... he's <laughs> Well, this Peter yeah, Parker looking like, kid, you know, on top of this thing, Peter Parker style, and it's just it's hysterical. Yeah, oh, I don't God. remember that episode, but now I gotta revisit it. Yeah, so I have, I have no problem with the multicultural stuff, just make it part of the st build it into the story, yeah, do you it in story, yeah. do it organically yeah. instead of yeah, it stand out. Yeah, wasn't the cast of Invisibles uh, multi ethnic? It's not yeah. like it's not like Grant spent uh, spent uh, issue number one introducing uh, every aspect of each uh, of, uh, of everyone's culture. Yeah. See, I've got, uh, at I, best they made they made Lord Lord Fanny Lord Fanny's origin a plot point, which was yeah. good for the story. There's a there's a dead. I, I can actually name some comics. There's a Dead Man uh, miniseries that came out a couple years ago where they went gothic romance with it. There was uh, an issue two of Dan Slot Spider Man, and I'm going blank as I'm talking. I was about to say another book, but you can actually go through those books, and when they shoehorn that stuff in, you can actually rip that page out, and you won't miss it with the story. That's what I hate. I, you've wasted a page of story. You know, um, I paid for this. Come on, man. You know, <laughs> if I can rip it out and not miss it in the story, then you're just pandering or whatever. I like to come up with a well, better at, word, but you know, at, at least make it interesting, right? Mm -hmm. I make it interesting for me. That's all I ask. Yeah, if I can rip it out of the book and not miss it, then you wasted my time. You know, right? Well, you could skip over half of this first issue and not miss anything. I mean, that was that was the main problem I had with it. And I like you know slice of life stuff. I'm 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 not you know I I like you know uh, navel gazing character stuff. I'm into that. It doesn't have to all be strictly plot with me, but give me something. 
<laughs> See, again, I missed the, I missed the times where I could go back and read some Strangers in Paradise, and I would be like, man, this was really Friends in the 90s, man. You know, <laughs> those were good problems. You know? Hipcats was like that, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I like that stuff. Oh, Hipcats was so good. I read two or three issues again, man. It still holds up. Oh, man. Yeah. I, I, I What's his name who I watch sometimes? Um, Perch? He's a comic shop owner in the... Um, Northwest, I think it is. Comics by Perch, I think is his channel. It's yeah. a pretty big channel, but he he does a lot of videos too. But he he I like his uh, s his um his stuff talking about the business of comic shops. But sometimes he does stuff on comics themselves that are a little dull. Yeah, like he did like a twenty minute one today that I only got through five minutes of on um, slice of life in superhero comics kind of thing that, as a new trend. And I was like, you know. To, to, to me, I was never a fan of it because I like slice of life comics. But once superhero comics start doing slice of life stuff within their comics, you're now competing with the guys who do that full time. And, and you're better, not going to usually well. better. Yeah. There's not yeah. So much to break it up. Now, here's the problem with being an international show, guys. I mean, I love <laughs> that we can say that. You know what I mean? But Palo said <laughs> Fanny, and now the stream is <laughs> in Britain. <laughs> The cultural differences is just dividing us, people. We got to come together. <laughs> I will, I will submit the bottom, but I will go against the whole country on what Fanny means. I can't help it. it just yeah. <laughs> well, the next comic I got is European, so we can show it. And it's um, what is the name of it? Eros and Psyche. Oh, I liked the uh, art of that. Th I, that's why I got it, and it's clearly a European graphic novel a graphic album because it's the wrong format there's all this space on the top and the bottom i love how clean this, it is yeah it's oh, clean. oh yeah it's Adam's really life. pretty clean art no, wait, the girls don't have right noses. wait wait jared wait here we okay. go technical difficulty there we go it's this real pretty clean art where the girls don't have noses mm -hmm. by uh what's her name maria love it but I like how they um, all have the Wednesday Adams dress on. That means something. Yeah, I, I think like it's, it's I look at it, I'm like, it means school. something. You know, this means something. It looks like and, a um, school uniform. This is, a, this is by a Blaze who publishes the, and I really liked it, but I, I'd rather have it in the European yeah. album format. And I actually checked. They're coming out with a collected edition in the fall, but it's this same size. Mm. So I'm like, ah, well, that's no fun. No, I, I guess that given the the size of the of their outfit, if if they were to do a, a collected edition off format, it would be really expensive. Yeah, yeah, I imagine so too. But like I said, some night, I, and it's funny because there was another book I care, by another company was publishing some Maria Lovett that was like right it was like on another shelf, but it was issue two of something, and I was like, and I looked through that, and was oh, it's pretty nice art, and then I said, oh, here's another Maria Lovett book and I, and I think Eros and Psyche is a Greek myth and looking up when the book was coming out they said that but this is about two schoolgirls uh, and their place in the school sort of thing and none of them have noses just nostrils <laughs> but I enjoyed it but I don't think I'm going to get the more issues of it just because you know one is enough to get the art because the story kind of and since it's not in the, the format I like, I don't think I'll buy more of it. Did it have like a, do you think the art had a little bit, I mean, I'm just going by what I'm seeing here. You know, when I watch mm -hmm. the playback, it's a little bit different, but um, it looked like it had a little bit of a love and rockets feel to it. Or am I just, is that just the way it's coming yeah. off? Uh, I, no, it's got a Jaime Hernandez kind of feel. Well, Beto too in the line Beto, because okay. of the, uh, because of the, the, the spotted blacks and the very, yeah. um, Hi, the, the very graphic nature of the drawing of just black and just white and some lines. That's kind of how Jaime draws. Nice. Oh, this comic is 10 years old. It was published 10 years ago by a French small publisher. Although um, the author is Spanish. Yes, yeah, copyright <laughs> 2011. Emmanuel Proust Edition. Yeah. And they've, they've got lots of cover. They have three covers for it, or one, two, three, four covers for it. So I guess everyone's putting out multiple covers. The, the art really was nice. Well, 
Well, on this end, the the great I've talked about it before. The great comic robbery, where back in the late two thousands, and I'm and I'm and it and I'm getting to where like I'm closing in on it. But it's where uh, one day, all of a sudden, in the late two thousands, I started looking at my boxes going through them. I'm like, this these books are loose. This is light, and somebody actually went through cherry picking. And I'm and thanks to finding out what comics are missing as the years go by, I think I know who did it. I'm down to three people. I don't care if it's been I don't care if it's been 13, 14 years. Oh my god. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. They went through I just had boxes that were not there was like little they were like not tied anymore. So I've I've on my as I find these books missing now that I have this CLZ app where I'm cataloging uh. all my books, I'm starting to find things. And I still have and you know, but anyway. I, I had these books in like my comic shop or something for like seriously like about a year or two. And I actually got emails telling me the prices were starting to go up. So I just pulled the trigger and got three. And this is how I'm, this is how the detective is working. The last book that is missing is from 2007. I'm zoning in on the exact year. Okay. <laughs> 2006 is out. <laughs> okay. Now we're moving forward. Right. But uh, this is part of that Justice uh, League, Justice Society crossover where Jeff Johns started bringing into Justice Society. And all I can figure out is that this was taken because it's a Mike Turner cover with Wallywood boobs. That's all I can figure out. You know what I'm saying? So. Right. <laughs> Justice Mind League the says, Maria Lovett was doing Faithless with Azarello. Oh, did I buy an issue? I'm not a fan of Azarello's writing, but I may have bought an issue of that just because I liked the artwork. I didn't remember it was her. Okay, cool. I'll have to look for that. Better writer than he is. Yeah. So this is another thing. This is why I think I'm down to three people because I only know two or three other people who read this. But this is a Justice League Europe number eight from '89, which is like a crossover with very bad vampires. You know what I mean? Like it's it's uh -huh. gifted to the Mantis. So I'm like, I know who read that. I know because I turned one of them <laughs> onto it. And then uh, this one really, this is the one that's throwing me off. This is All-Star Squadron number four. The only one I need. And I actually had this in the 80s. And I can't figure out why they would have took it, but it's got the first appearance of that Grand Dragon that was on the Stargirl show, if you watch it. But I don't know if that's why they took it. I think they saw uh, I think they saw Superman. It was like, I'm taking it. It looks really old. And this is one of those Roy Thomas books where it's nothing but words almost. You know? <laughs> So I'm zoning in on him. I'm coming after him. Then I'm one after that guy in Roanoke who took my books off the U-Haul. I'm going to find them all. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And doing corrections on a Roy Thomas page was especially challenging too. That's I remember right. the letter saying, because oh. you had to find, you now had to find room for stuff where there was no room. Yeah. You'd, you'd have to like, um, it, you'd have to redo the entire block or blue or whatever it was you have to do the, the whole thing or the whole line at the very least depending on what was being added or subtracted you could just have to rerun the whole thing well, that's funny because i mean it just dawned on me that roy thomas was back the time you guys were there probably like doing doctor strange and picking up avengers west coast and all that stuff yeah he was still yeah. writing stuff i never met him then so he wasn't in New York, I don't think. He must have been in California. Yeah, Scott, did you meet him at Heroes? I met him a couple yeah, times. Yeah, I met him several uh, times. Yeah, yeah back to 2001. I got some Conan DVD movies, the second one, Conan Destroyer. I got him to sign some All-Star Squadron, which was like some of the first books I bought as a kid with my money that he wrote. Um, but... I also got him to sign my Conan the Destroyer DVD, and you don't talk to Roy Thomas. Roy Thomas, you might bring up a topic, and then he's going to give you the whole story. It's, yeah, it's still it's, awesome. It's though. something I know. It's like you know, people will talk to Roy, and he's talking about you know superhero, superhero. But you bring up Conan, and Roy just starts rambling. Yeah, yeah. He <laughs> he was the reason Grace Jones got in Conan the Destroyer because no. I can't, yeah, no, Ben's no. Doubt was the reason that Grace Jones got in Conan Destroyer. No, Roy Thomas said when they were messing with the script, they brought up some actresses that did not fit what the race was that um, the warrior race that she's from or whatever. And they were like, "What are you talking about?" And he was like, "You want somebody like Grace Jones?" He used her as an example. And then he said the movie came out and there was Grace Jones. You know, <laughs> like, you know. Yeah, so, William Stout actually. Um, it was Stout. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? recommended Grace Jones to one of the producers. Yeah. And then they checked out, oh, yeah, we need to get her. But the, the 
the one time I met Roy Thomas if, just a few years ago at a con, I got to ask him about a Marvel rumor that I always heard around the offices, <laughs> um, which was uh, what what stats are. Um, a stat is how companies archive their artwork, Marvel, DC, whoever. That's how they used to do it. They'd take a photo stat. And at Marvel, there was a you know there's a room where and it's a big camera, and you'd put the 11 by 17 artwork on the big camera and you take a black and white photo of it, and it's kind of like a fancy photocopy except much more archival because it's silver halide based. It's a photograph. It smells. Um, <laughs> yeah, all the all the same photochemicals were used. Oh yeah, yeah. So awesome. anyway, that's how Marvel used to. Um, archive their artwork you know they, they, they'd stat the, they'd stat it and send it to the warehouse and there was i always heard this story around the offices where in the 70s where roy when roy thomas was editor-in-chief of marvel he decided as editor-in-chief that marvel didn't need this bunch of stats anymore so he ordered them you know to get rid of them and then as roy thomas the fan he decided he may as well take these home so he took them home, and then years later, Marvel needed those stats, so he, Roy sold them back to him. That was the story I always heard, and I, I and I never quite believed it. I was always like, ah. so the first I, I, and we were at um, I was at a convention with uh, Bob Wyacek. I was hanging out at Bob's table, and next to Bob was Roy Thomas with this big long line. So I happened to be sitting next to Roy for a little while. I turned to, and I turned to him and was like, Roy, you have to tell me if this story is true or not. I picked it up and you know, I told him the whole story. About it, and he was like, stats? I never had anything to do with stats. <laughs> I, I was like, thanks. I, I, I always found that story a little shaky anyway. So, But I, I got to confirm that that never happened. That's fantastic. <laughs> I'm kind of sad that that never happened. Yeah. So because uh, it was a story of getting one over on the man, and so many <laughs> of those stories of getting getting one over on the man are just not true. <laughs> see, I like underdog stories, and you're like screw the man stories. I, I see where this <laughs> is. So this may be the comment of the night. <laughs> what would a co-written Roy Thomas, Chris Claremont, and Doug McGregor book look like? It so, would come out. It would. They'll all cancel each off. other out and have like three balloons a page. No, they. <laughs> I think no, it'd they, be like having a black hole instead of a black hole instead of a black hole. You know, <laughs> it uh, they'd like, have a hold in on itself and disappear. It would be like all word balloons, and the only room you would have, the only artist that would be able to pull that off, would have been Matt Fazell because you'd have to draw the stick figures because that's the only room you had to work with. Yeah. What'd you say, Paolo? No, they'd have a plot meeting, uh, yell at each other for eight hours, and then quit. <laughs> Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> the whole well, could be Sergio Aragones like margin drawings. <laughs> or we could have Jack Katz just draw the page in the same format he did First Kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> I I'm picturing like Roy Thomas trying to find continuity to 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 fix and and Chris Claremont being like it's not storm for the 50th time, I swear. You know, I'm like, <laughs> now that she brought it up, I want to see a comic of just Sergio doing illustrations of this staff meeting that they're having and they're all arguing with each other. That would be better. <laughs> that, that, that would be, be better. Yeah. Yeah. The book that those that Claremont and, uh, and, and Thomas wrote is just a plot point for Sergio. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the funny thing is uh, uh, when you translate from English to a, to a Latin language, you need more room. Mm. And yet when I was growing up and reading Roy Thomas and Chris Claremont stories, they after I when I finally get got to compare them to the original, dialogue was cut to one third of the original. <laughs> oh wow! And you that was still knew what was going on, and you still yeah, knew what was, was going on. Didn't exactly, you? Yeah. there was a very good translator. <laughs> the, the last comic I got for the week was the one that was on my pull list, and it's only an issue two, so I got like two issue twos and three issue ones. Radiant Black issue two. Um, I liked issue one. It's very much sort of a buddy so teen, teen. Well, not quite teen. The guy's older than that. They, they kind of act like teens. 
I think the guys not now now that I think of it, the guys in his thirties. You know what it is? The guys in his thirties, his writing career just collapsed, and he's moving back to his old hometown and living with his parents. And his the guy who he was buddies with in high school is hanging out with him again. So it's kind of like there's this uh the kind of go- he's kind of going back to his teenage years even though he's in his 30s cuz I it didn't even strike me that he was in his 30s so I just started talking about it cuz even when you look at him he doesn't th- he doesn't look like he's in his 30s that, that he may as well be you know in an invincible comet Oops, let me see if I can get it I can't even get it to see it he, they, he, he looks like a teenager that, I mean there's not panel, a lot of lines on his face yeah and that's Hold on, that top panel looked like a something about Mary haircut. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, he, he's got that going on too. But he, I think they're kind of drawn, kind of like because he, the the artist who is, um, who's the artist on this? Uh, Marcella Costa. Oh, uh, Paolo's cousin. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle Higgins is the writer. Uh, you know, he, he's doing this very, it, it, it kind of reminds me of Invincible, the artwork and sort of the story. Because it's this guy, he he grabs some, they're walking along and there's some globe that gives him this Power Ranger costume and he's trying to figure out what's going on. So it's, you know, it's kind of very much like early Invincible, very much sort of like Greatest American Hero, except on, uh, except it's more of a, like Invincible had his father to show him the ropes. He's got his buddy to try and help him figure out the ropes. So it, 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 it's more of a buddy comedy than Invincible was. But I'm, I'm enjoying solid, solid comic so far. Nice. All right. I'm going to show my last stack here real quick. I'll spare a lot of people because it's a quick explanation here. Thanks to WandaVision, and I think these books are going to be forgotten about now that we have their new show. Falcon. I, I don't have Disney Plus, but I hear things, you know. Uh oh, he just hit leave. He just hit left instead of uh, share, instead of four. The buttons are right next to each other. That's why uh, I, I know that's what happened. I've almost done that a million times. I hurt my own feelings. Is that possible? No. <laughs> <laughs> you, you put le- you hit la- leave stream instead of share screen. They're right next to each other. Yeah. Why did they do that? I, I don't know they're right next to each other, but all I did was just touch it so I could move the cursor up. I didn't know it was covering <laughs> over it already. You know, that was waiting on That was a booby trap. I, I hurt my own feelings. Is, that, that is such a booby trap. <laughs> All right. All right. But I like how you were right there. But thanks to WandaVision, I showed a couple of weeks ago, I had all these books already. You know, the John Byrne, White Vision, all that stuff, the Yesterday Question Avengers. Then it dawned on me, thanks to this stupid show, I'm never going to know how the story ended. So I ended up looking <laughs> up and I found these in like a, some uh, a way back place that has like boxes of comics that nobody's gone through in months. So I knew I would find these. Right. So I got on a roll. I'm like, you know, the way these shows go, I might want to finish the evolutionary war as bad as it was. We are living in weird times when the West coast Avengers books are like keys. You know what I mean? And then I started thinking, I better get those damn Jim Lee books because the Alpha Flight could take off in five years when they're, <laughs> you know, when they start scraping the bottom of the barrel, they're going to go after Alpha Flight, you know. So, yeah, I already even got those while they were like I could find them cheap and stuff. But uh, yeah, it kind of killed me that I was like, you know, I've, I've had thirty years to finish that story. It might be time before you know anything yeah, else. I remember. Happened. I, I was loving John Byrne doing the, the West Coast Avengers, and then all of a it was sudden, fun. yeah, Roy Thomas and Paul Ryan. Like, mm-hmm. what happened? Oh, yeah. did Byrne Rage quit again? But <laughs> I think I think I sent it to a chat, and all of you guys, somebody sent me another one. I, I, I um, I messaged me. I got to start like remembering who these nice people are. But they were like, "You want to check out this book?" So. You had the White Vision, John Byrne, West Coast Avengers 45 or whatever, you know, blow up. You go two issues up, I think is what it is. And there was another book starting to blow up in that run because the vision was in the corner panel. It was the first time the White Vision was put in the Marvel corner box. That's how desperate people are getting to try to say something's a key and make some money online. I'm I'm saying step away from online collecting. It's you know there's they're getting put vision there. in the corner. Yeah, yeah. White and, uh, vision head in the corner, six bucks. You know. 
I, I just want to point out to Sanctuary of Reality that I have a random ALF annual with with a Turtles parody in it. And I have no idea why I have this. There's the Turtles parody down there. Teenage Mutant Melnut Abstract Turtles. <laughs> because um, ALF is cool, man. I don't care what anybody says. I must have brought it home from Marvel, and I don't know why. I have no idea why I saved this why this isn't this is the only issue of alf i have i've never collected alf i've never been an alf fan but what for years? some reason what probably, years? I have, probably I not watch. i got number one right over here on the shelf alf was cool the show was hit or miss but the saturday morning cartoon where he was on mail mac great cartoon it was awesome yeah good cartoon maybe was this was one of the earliest things i worked on i don't know yeah, you'd watch uh, you'd watch a little Pee Wee Herman while they still had it on, maybe a little Mighty Mouse, and then you would turn over, watch a little Saved by the Bell, go back to NBC, watch a little Alf, and then you get ready to go to the skating rink. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I was watching, but I definitely was not watching Saved by the Bell. <laughs> Tiffany That's Amber Thiessen. Harsh. I'm the only one that'll be honest about it. It was t it wasn't a Tiffany Amber Thiessen episode. You just went on with your day. That's all. <laughs> not not an Elizabeth <laughs> Berkeley fan. More of a you're you're more of the Tiffany. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Berkeley was. I mean, she was unfortunate looking in my eyes. That's a good way to put it. I'm just saying. You know, just unfortunate. Yeah. But you she know. became a showgirl. Yeah. She was so excited, so excited, so excited. I just was like, yeah, I don't, I don't that, need, I need calmness in my life. You know, wasn't I mean, that the first movie you bought when you got a Blu-ray player with Showgirls? No, no. What was it? It wasn't Showgirls. See, you're joking, and I'm sitting here like I really need to know what my first Blu-ray was. No, Blade Runner. Blade Runner was my first one. Mine was. By the way, this is the way I do my mylar now. I cut off a piece the, the I cut off the corners at a 30 degree angle you can see there and then they tuck right underneath you have an alf annual in a mylar bag <laughs> i've got an alf <laughs> annual in a mylar bag slam it of course he does he has everything in a mylar bag no no i, I switched over most of my collection in like the early 2000s but then i, I ran out of money for when i've been using poly bags really good, and, and, but someday i'll put other stuff in my this bag. has been the weirdest night i mean <laughs> <laughs> i have never seen an i've seen things i've never seen before alf annual in a mylar bag and i don't usually use backing boards either but this one's got a backing board yeah, but i have a ralph snart issue in mylar you got me beat. <laughs> you got me beat. Hey, I've got my issues of Night Streets in Mylar. <laughs> Put them in there. Yeah. Did you see where Terrence had a stream the other day and he got a issue of Night Yeah, Street? yeah, I saw that one. He got he got the uh, TPBs. Yeah. I still haven't gotten those yet. And, and there was uh, and uh, one of the one people on Twitter said I didn't realize this. Um, uh, on Twitter, there was another guy who saw my comment about Night Streets or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he put, he was, he wrote a blog about Night Streets. Night Streets was an 80s indie comic, black and white indie comic, which we mentioned a couple of shows ago from 86, 87. My guy named Mark, Mark, uh, Mark Bloodworth. And I was just showing, you know, I read it and I, I bought it way back then and I just reread it like last week. And it, it, re, it was really, I'm not usually a big nostalgia person, but it was really nostalgic for me. Brought me right back to the 80s black and white boom. And uh, Terrence loves comic crack, loves that 80s outlaw comic stuff in underground. Comics. So he, he he's the only other person I ever saw to track those down. That's what made me think of it again. So um and so a third person chimed in that they wrote wrote a blog on Night Streets like three years ago. And he was such a fan of Night Streets. Night Streets. He had Mark Bloodworth uh, paint him the cover to issue number one since the original art is long gone. For, you know, he had him re do, do a commission to do a new version of Night Streets number one painting. The way this night's gone, I swear I thought you were going to say that. He autographed his arm and tattooed it. Over it, you know, I, was like, I, was, I was waiting for something like that. I was like, he, he paused, and I had time. And, to and and then this guy told us something we didn't know. He didn't know, and he he ended up in like in 2017. You can find it on the blog, interviewing Mark, a short interview of Mark Bloodworth, and he said like in the early 2000s, he even did sort of a sequel 
to Night Streets. Well, like two issues in some anthology where he had like the characters from Night Streets daughter in this new comic talking about her mother and stuff like that. I was like, oh, I'm going to track it. Some obscure mm. indie comic from the 2000s. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, oh, you have to find that one too. <laughs> Good times. Oh my yeah. God. Hunting down old comics. Oh man. Oh, you know, I'm not usually at a loss for words, man, but that, that it did it a minute ago. The, the, the you know, Jared will do that to you. Well, it, it really <laughs> happens, but like, like I was, I was, I was one time I was traveling for work and uh, the, there's a bar attached to the hotel we were staying at friendly little place trucker stopped there. And we went in there and was shooting pool. We kept beating the trucker. And luckily it wasn't my turn. I actually lost the table to my buddy that was with me. And he got us. He went over there, got a cube of ice, and he got his beer. And he put the ice under the beer. And for some reason, that hypnotized us. That's what's happened tonight with Alf. You know, like, I, can't, I can't tell you why it works, but it does. <laughs> now that I think of it, this, the, this must have been the first comic I ever worked on at Marvel. That because it's a nineteen nine because I started there right in about nineteen ninety it could have been I don't know are you are you Why familiar with, ever keep this? have you are you familiar with the inappropriate cover Alf that everybody wants yes yes, still yes. Want? did you work on that it's it, it no. has a uh, seal rape on it is what they're saying no. Alf yeah. sitting <laughs> on the floor and he's grabbing a seal and the seal is screaming and people have read into that. And <laughs> it's like worth a lot of money. That's what's funny. I'm know. sure it was completely unintentional. I no, don't know. No, That's no. what I'm asking. I'm I'm thinking I'm, I'm thinking this is going to be the big break. How that ever got past an editor somewhere is like wow. Well, we got two Pictures people were at Marvel at the time. Know. That's why I'm asking. You know, maybe they don't want maybe they don't want to admit to it. You know, like <laughs> yeah. And I don't think I showed this one last week. I don't remember. Um, I got it because it's a magazine size one. It's one of these heavy metal oh, ones. It's, oh, that's it's Bart nice. Sears. And yeah. I really, I'm not, I'm not usually a Bart Sears fan, but I really liked the art in this one. Yeah, I met uh, Bart Sears up in Con, up uh, Baltimore Con, and I saw some stuff that didn't look like it, it was. It was more like what you're showing here, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. What's some really name? nice. stuff. The cover is terrible. The, whoever did the design around here just it printed terribly. It looks terrible. This purple and black. They should just made the figure bigger. I don't know why they didn't. What's but this is one of those. Um, that looks like it's only three. I think it's four dollars. But it's stories. They're taking some of their, you know, the anthology. The, like this, this appeared in like three issues of Heavy Metal, I think. Uh, so it's about it's about regular com. It's about thirty pages. Uh, it, you know, it's not even the whole story, I think. But I guess they're they, they want to get some more money, so they're printing it this way too, which I think is pretty cool. I mean, I I liked it. What's the name? Maiden by name? Michelle Sears and Bart Sears. Not the greatest story ever, but I enjoyed the art. Dryer sheets dryer will sheets cover up. Yeah. You can use dryer no, sheets. I've heard. Go ahead. That's how you get odors out of, out of your comics. If you, right. Mm -hmm. If your comics, mm -hmm. if, if like your comics smell like must or cigarette smoke, mm -hmm. you put them in a box with dryer sheets. And it, over I've never time. done it, but I'm told that's how it's done. Oh, okay. I'm done. Kitty oh, litter works better, and I'd like to kitty point out that works. I'm not a cat person, so I don't have kitty litter on hand. But um, but that's how uh, you get smells out of old, out of books in general. Yeah. Oh, I, I've got a book I need to do. I that. think you ought to be careful with kitty litter in comics. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you have to sort of find a way to hang them. Yeah, you, you'd you'd have to open the books and like let them sit on top to get in the. Yeah, you'd have to find get a way a to do that. Get a wire. And I, I mean, I'm picturing this. You get a wire hang it. Or, or a clothesline, open your bag and just get a yep. clothespin. Maybe that'll work or something. Or maybe if you're brave enough, do it upside down. I don't know. I a clothespin? You want to put dents in your comic? No, 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 no. On, the, on a... the lip, on the lip of your open bag. Oh, uh, you got to take it out of the bag. Otherwise it won't work. Uh, that is true. <laughs> Well, you can always take like a wire and sort of hang the, you know, make, hang make a spider web and lay them flat and then flip it over. Oh, yeah, you can do yeah. that. Do there. it a two step process. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. And and then, clumping get stuff. a book that doesn't stink. So. Mm -hmm. so I've got a challenge for tonight for the for getting towards the end here. 
But and I don't know why I'm going this way with it. I don't know, man. But I want you to think if you can top a more depressing book than this one. I want to know if you can really think of something more. There's not a sad story, not a touching story, not somebody that died in somebody's arms, nothing like that. I mean, something that truly sucks and was sad. And you not, read not it. The kid who like, collected Spider Man. Warren Ellis ruins. I don't know why I keep this. This is the most depressing piece of garbage I've ever read. Yet I keep mm. going back every couple months just to flip through it to remind myself. Like you talk about a glutton for punishment. I'm like, hold on. I'll, I'll, I'll get you the most depressing book that, that I love. Being forced yeah. to read Salas Marner in high school English. Yeah. I don't know. But you read this and everything is just like he was, he he doesn't come off like he wrote this story. That's a uh, this was supposed to be like the anti Marvels by Kurt Music and uh, Alex Ross. Mm -hmm. And everything is just horrible in this. You know, um, you know, I think Peter Parker killed people because he was radioactive. You know what I mean? Things like that. <laughs> uh, the Hulk is nothing but a big lump of flesh laying on the ground. Uh, you know, all this stuff. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's just so, terrible. you read it, you read it and you're just saying myself. I don't know, but you read it and you're just sort of like, you know, Warren Ellis was in a very bad place when he wrote this. It doesn't, feel, it doesn't feel like a story. It feels like he's being like cathartic and he's lashing out, you know, and I'm like, I feel horrible. What after I read this, I don't know why I go back. I think I read it to count my blessings in life. You know, <laughs> I can't find the book I want to show you, but it's, uh, I think I've mentioned it before. It's market day by James Sturm. I remember. Have you ever read that one? Uh, He's the guy who did uh, Golem's Mighty Swing. <laughs> I got canned and so cool. It's about um, it's it's the story of like an 18th century rug maker, but it's really all an allegory for being a cartoonist. Okay. Okay, and be. Because it's the story of this 18th century. I think I may have got the century wrong. I don't even know what century rug maker, but a long time ago in Europe, he makes rugs. Um, I think it was at sort of at the beginning of industrialization. And this is a guy who, you know, he puts his heart and soul into his rugs. He makes great rugs, but he doesn't, the only way he makes money for, from them is on market day. He goes into town. The, I have to go to this big. It's a long journey for him. Goes into this big town, and most of the rugs there are these, you know, crappy machine-made rugs or cheaply made rugs. But his are like beautiful rugs. And there's this one rug seller who buys them from him, and that's when he makes his money for the year. And so the whole story is about him and his rugs. And, and he's kind of depressed. His marriage isn't doing well. Maybe he has a sick child. I can't even remember the exact details. I haven't read it in a while. But like I said, and this is all a metaphor for being a cartoonist. Mm -hmm. um, and so he brings his, he brings, he finally, he's like, oh, finally, I'll have some, some money and maybe some good fortune to take care of my family. And he goes into the rug maker and he finds out the rug maker he sold, he sells his rugs to every year has died and his son has taken over the business. And his son's like, his son does not care about the art of rug making. He does not care about these rugs. And he, and he finds out that the guy who's been buying his rugs wasn't even selling them all. He had a, he had a backlog of them in the warehouse and so the guy is like, well, you know, the guy w was going to give him, you know, um, sort of cheap, cheap industrial made rug prices for his rugs. And the, the son's just like, hey, take it or leave it. I don't care. I don't need these rugs. I don't even want them. Well, my father was the only one who bought your stupid rugs. <laughs> and the guy, of course, is just his whole world is shattered. I think because, it's, you know, this, yeah. this was I'm his livelihood. This was how he took care of his family. Well, it was an and, and yeah. And and the, the 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 you know the end of the book is him taking his rugs back home, trying to figure out what he's going to do with his life, how he's going to feed his family, and it's just a, and the whole thing is like a metaphor for being a cartoonist, and it's a metaphor for you know when you're a cartoonist and you're a freelancer and you really only have one person who employs you, right? How tenuous that lifestyle is, mm -hmm. which explains why Jim Sturm became a, a cartooning teacher, I think, at uh, 
somewhere, maybe it down in Savannah, I think it was. But it was like it was just like, whoa, that was like the saddest thing. And <laughs> that's that's the saddest comic I can think um, of. That's super depressing. <laughs> yeah, market day, but so well done. One of the saddest ones I ever read, although it's a really good story, is a one shot by Von Bodie. It was called The Man. Ah. Yeah. And it's just a, a caveman and his spear. And it's it's depressing as hell, but it's a really good story. And you'll if you don't cry at the end, something's wrong with you. I'm gonna be looking up those pages when we get off here, man. I've yeah. my, the, the stepdad had a collection, and I know exactly which one you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Nice. It is sad, you know. I'm looking around to see if I have anything sadder than <laughs> Market Day. I don't think so. Yeah, like, that would hit close to home, too. You know. sad. And there's one other book I wanted to show, just because I forgot I had it. <laughs> I discovered it on my shelf as I was going through stuff. And I was like, oh, that's right. I have this one. Because I've been enjoying um, Brandon... Uh, Brandon Graham's new book. Uh, what the heck's the name of it? Shit, I can't even remember. But I'm enjoying his new book. But and I had this multiple warheads uh, on my shelf. There's more Brandon Graham stuff. You know, cross between Eric Larson, <laughs> Eric Larson. Uh, I cross between Gary Larson and Mobius. And this is real. This I think this was the first. Uh, Brandon Graham thing I read and it was tough because it's the last part of a story. It says, it even says in here, um, one shot final chapter to ghost town that ran in Island magazine. I think you can take me off the solo now. Yeah. Well, I went to where you were doing that. I went and found something because of a comment. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah. I, found but I, 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 and real once again, it was, it's hard to figure out exactly what's going on because I don't know the first part of the story, but very enjoyable nonetheless. And I love this cover. I just yeah. love the cover. I mean, I've had I like the cover the sitting there all week. The I love the artwork there. That's yeah. I, I love Moby yeah. stuff, and it looked just like it. What the heck was the name of this? Hold on, I have to walk over to my shelf just so I can get the name. Okay, Matthew Rasco here, uh, and I agree with him. Like you know, we've gone from like this depressing, sad, depressing kind of sad mm -hmm. to just a very sad story. Uh, Lagoon Chinatown. This book, which is amazing, I talked to Eric Powell and I told him this helped me get through my divorce in a weird way because you yeah. find out how the goon got his heart broke and how he got a scar on his face and all this stuff. And it's pretty bad. And when I told that to Eric Powell, he was like, you know, you're not the first guy to tell me that. It's, it's, and it's not like a thing where you read it and it's a self-help book. You just kind of read it and it's kind of cathartic. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, we, you know, y'all been there. So uh, after I showed it to him, he drew the goon in it for me. But, oh, my uh, God, so cool. oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Eric, yeah. But um, but yeah, I had a real good talk with Eric Powell about this book uh, one year. And then uh, I don't know. I wonder what year it was. Probably like the 2000s. I don't know. I got pictures on Facebook somewhere I can find them. But yeah, I agree. Chinatown is like one of those uncredited book everybody should have in their in their um collection i think rain like hammers is the name of granny graham's new one by the way just uh, afraid i'd, I'd, uh, I'd uh, is, is let everybody out there know is, i've been enjoying this one that's why i pulled out the other jared have these guys seen your shelf your 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 wall o comics i i don't know i don't i don't usually show it off it's just a, I, it's just I, shelves I, with comics on it like uh tim's in my behind him yeah you uh you sh you went through a bunch of stuff years ago when we were doing that uh yeah that thing where we'd have ten to fifteen people behind the scene you know we weren't broadcast right. but there was a right. night you went through everything then the next because okay. the next night I remember it because the next night they had me go through my boxes they were like well Jared did it you know <laughs> <laughs> shelves of comics well it's just I think everything's in Mylar there isn't it. Uh, no, well, a, a good a good portion of it is like all my childhood Marvel comics are in Mylar now. Mm. A lot of my indie stuff is in my like I, I probably I probably bought like a few thousand Mylar bags in the early two thousands. Yeah, and switched a lot of my stuff that had been bagged since the seventies and eighties over to Mylar. Gotcha. I'm a big fan of Mylar. Oh yeah. So That's am I. Big. And I, I would have bought more, except I haven't had the money for it. But okay. So 
if the fanzine is still a thing we're doing and stuff, I sent some pictures and stuff and messenger and stuff, but I found I something. Him. There's a, something I kind of want to put in it. This is the article from 1985, July of 85 that I cut out from a magazine that announced the death of uh, Supergirl four months before it happened. The spoil crisis. Uh -huh. I'm kind of thinking maybe we, uh, I could like get that to you somehow. And like stick you'd, that have to, you'd have to mail it to me or something if you don't have a scanner because that looks like it needs to be scanned in. Oh, I got we I, I can get our I think I can get our stuff to scan. It just might have to be in two pieces where it's so that's fine oblong. But two yeah, pieces is fine. Yeah, we're doing a fanzine and uh, I always kind of do it like Richard Starkings did. Oh, well, now the pressure's on. You know, I heard that <laughs> Richard Starking stuff, and that's exactly where my head went. Like, oh crap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> so, but if there's anybody out, how are we doing this? Is this asking people if they want to put stuff in, or are we reaching out? Or sure, we'll reach. We'll reach out and we'll see. I, I don't. Do Paolo or Scott want to write anything? I kind sure. of assumed they were. Then I realized <laughs> they were. Know. They've never said anything. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, do, do we need that? I'll, I'll write something. Okay. Here, here's something I, I I I was writing this week. I think it may be cool for others to join in too. This is first issue special number seven, starting the creeper. Yeah. Um, and this is one of the comics from my childhood that taught me a sort of about the art and craft of comics. In that, um, and I and I and I wrote sort of a page by page breakdown of it. I'll send it to you. And I figured it'd be cool if if you guys kind of responded to whatever page wrote like whatever you want about it too but what made this like special to my childhood was this was probably one of the first modern this came out in 75 i probably got it in 76 or so and um it was the first so, like i knew steve ditko from the was the original spider-man guy the original dr strange guy and i'd probably read um like Amazing Fantasy 15 and Spider-Man number one in the origin books yet uh, at that time. But I hadn't read like the Spider-Man 1 through 20 that came out in the pocket books. So this was, um, and first of all, I was a Marvel kid too. So that that's what I, I, and I really, and I still to this day prefer, prefer you know, 1970s Marvel to mm -hmm. um, DC. The Bronze Age, if you will, yeah. But this, yeah, but but this Ditko thing was like so different from 1976 Marvel, but also so, I could, you know, I could as at nine or ten, I could recognize how well crafted this comic was, even though it, it may not, it may not be like a, a, a like uh, I may not have liked the style as much as I liked you know 70s marvel stuff i recognized how well crafted this comic was and i used to go back to it all the time and look at it and try to figure out what made it so you know i didn't know the term well crafted at nine or ten nor the concept but that that's what i was trying to figure out as i looked at this comic when i was 10 so i was i was that's why I, I took this it's 18 pages and i just basically wrote something about the craft of each page nice Nice. Now is that, is that I figured, the fanzine? Is that for the fanzine? Yeah, it's gonna be the awesome. fanzine. That's for the awesome. fanzine I wrote that. So I figured what would be cool is like if I gave that to to you guys and you could get this, you know, the same issue. I, I think I, I might have a digital copy of it too that I could give you. And you could write whatever you want about it. So we could have like different perspectives. This is why Jared on. turned out the way he did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about like adding dialogue. I might that re dialogue the book. I don't know. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but we got, I got to wind it up here. Um, it's as usual. I got dinner to eat and I want to try to get the wife to get up at like super early in the morning to go to like 170 table vendor show in gray Tennessee that I think is two hours from here. Good we'll luck. <laughs> Wear That's your good. mask. That's you haven't got one. that second shot yet. <laughs> I'm a healthcare worker, believe me. I'm, I'm, you're preaching to the <laughs> choir here. I'm the one that has to convince other people. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, the special guest, Daisy, you can be honest. What did you think? Oh my God, I had so much fun. Yay. Okay, cool, cool. You enjoyed me going off on Richard Starkey. When do well, I? Did. Yeah. It's I love the yeah. I love Jared Rents. It's uh, and I'm sorry, Richard. I know everyone says you're a nice guy. I I don't. <laughs> I don't doubt that, but 
Yeah, and I'm, I'm damn it, you made me clean up your mess too many times. I completely <laughs> over any bitterness I may once have had back in 1998. Uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm over it, but I still remember it. You know, it doesn't. Uh, well, yeah. somebody through this entire show has been popping in and out, going by the numbers. I bet you it was uh -huh. Richard. I'm just saying, <laughs> somebody <laughs> called him. Somebody texted him. Something happened somehow. You know. Whoops. Well, I apologize to him for going off on a rant. <laughs> At the very end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's stuck in through the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they apologize by the end of the show. But I <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. Scott, Palo, final words, anything? Yeah, I gotta buy. I gotta buy stuff whenever I can because uh, we've we're finally getting a Richard Corbin comic published in Portugal. All right, and, and it's the the Edgar Allan Poe stories. Okay, oh, is that awesome. from Marvel? Hmm? Is that from Dark, Marvel or Dark Horse? I think it was Dark. May have been uh, compiled by Dark Horse. We already had a Portuguese edition of um, of his Cage mini series. Uh, but this okay. is the first time that we're getting uh, the uh, f uh, full Corbin work. Um, that issue of Last Gasp that I ordered, the slow death, the new slow death one, is going to be Corbin's last public uh, work. Ah. I have no idea if I sent it to you guys, but I remember sending, you know, taking the pictures when I found it. But I have a spirit magazine that has um, uh, Corbin doing the spirit, like three pages. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever like, seen that. One of the Warren uh, magazines. Yeah, and I've had it probably for like seven years, and I, I, I bought a bunch of them, believe it or not, for like a buck a piece, and I just sort of took my time getting through them. Is that the one know? where he's like running on a train track? I have to look at it. It's a special issue of the magazine where they had a bunch of big time creators at the time come in, and they all did a couple pages for a brand new story that um, Eisner did. So, yeah. All right, guys. Uh, you're gonna get me. We're gonna get rolling again if I don't get here, and I'm gonna then I'm gonna pass out because I haven't ate, and you guys are gonna be like, "He's all right." We're just gonna keep talking. I know. Yeah, I think Bart Sears did Exo Man Award. Yeah, he did. He did. He did. He came right. on and uh, he did Turok. Uh, Turok also for him. He did the Exo Man Award series, and I think he did some uh, Turok for Valiant in the early '90s. So Bart was all over the place. Uh, he got a lot of fans when he would do his art lessons in uh, Wizard Magazine. To me, that's yeah, yeah. So yeah. Now we're the Sears catalog. All <laughs> right, well, everybody, be excellent to each other, and um, I'm sure Daisy will be back at some point in time. So. Oh, I totally want to. I'll I'll have to uh, I'll have to bring some comics to 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 do the show and tell. I don't know what I was. Yeah, thinking. I totally forgot. <laughs> You you never you've never subbed to this channel or Jared's channel and hit that bell, did you? You never watched. I'm on to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, she I, just found out like two weeks ago. I just and as soon as I found out, I started watching her. Are you kidding me? I love uh, that you guys uh, were there. there. So, yeah. She's on Zoom. We know when she found out. It was two weeks ago. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Later, everyone. Bye. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.